four of Sunday. Yeah, this Super Bowl championship for New England, a little bit different than uh, yeah. their previous five. Just one touchdown in the entire game. And it came on a drive where Josh McDaniels, throughout the game plan, huddled everybody up on the sideline, mm -hmm. according to Dwayne Allen, the tight end, said, we haven't practiced any of this, but I've got an idea that I think is going to work. What was it, David, and why did it work? It was, it was a really good idea because it's something that they've really been working on for the last six months, preparing fullback on the field, heavy personnel. This was a 22 personnel, two tight ends. It started off with actually with a play with 12 personnel with just Rob out there with two receivers, Hogan and Edelman at the bottom. Man coverage, play action fake. You get Gronk to block. Looks like it's just a power run like they've been running all day. And then Gronk releases. Actually, it's played pretty well by the defensive end, but it's just a good throw. Nice up and over the top. And that gets him to midfield. And this is where it started. They ran out 22 personnel. Edelman's the only receiver on the field right now. He's on the inside. And he pretty much has in between the numbers to do whatever he wants to do. He can go anyway. This is really a no-win situation for the, for the defensive back covering him. Obviously, Brady feels comfortable throwing Edelman, picks up nice 15 yard gain. Then they go to another, the nice part, Wade changed the looks up. He tried to now double the inside guys with Gronk and then Edelman up top. They're trying to really just jam him, almost like a punt return, but he finds the one-on-one, -on -one, throws it to the outside. Again, makes the exact right decision. They get up on the ball, same personnel group, same formation, really. It's the same play. They ran two plays ago. Gronkowski said he knew that he was going to be open this time and that Brady was coming, and there's not a lot of window in here. There's not a lot of room to throw this football, but he goes there as he usually does time and time again to Gronk in crutch situations or clutch situations gets down inside the five yard line but it was just masterful because initially I thought well they're just lining up in a look they don't really know what to line up in or how to play this they change the look every time and Brady found the exact right place to go all bigs yeah uh, jumbo package across yep. the board so they've got uh, Rob Gronkowski Dwayne Allen yep. uh, Rex Burkhead is your back yeah, James Devlin White, is in. Yeah. Yes. Edelman's Patterson. the only guy who's not a big Edelman's that they the actually left in the game what what matchup was that there that he was looking well they, for? they were hoping that they would get some type of man coverage and then they could work kind of how they did in the middle of the field because Edelman had been doing that all day but even if they played zone they had winners they had Marcus Peters playing off on Burkhead you could just throw out there throw a hitch get eight ten yards and they just felt like they had completions on the field and really in a game where completions were hard to come by why not just stay in it and see if you can make some plays down the field? And he made that one huge throw to Gronk, which is really the only tight window throw he had to make that whole drive, mm -hmm. but he made it. And then bring yeah. in Sony to, to finish cap it, it off right. at the yep. end. Tom Brady and the Patriots stepping up offensively. Surprise, surprise. Now let's flip the coin just a little bit and talk a little bit about that Patriots defense because we saw the disruption, whether right. it was the defensive line or the linebacking core. Jared Goff, 18 of 38, and he was sacked four times. How were they able to get to him and do so so effectively? Well, as a coordinator, you go back and you see where he's struggling. And what stood out to me was the Bears game. They really got after him a bunch of things and you see here in the tape there no the Patriots knew if we put pressure on him he's gonna have issues right here the nose tackle gum comes down takes to allowing a situation where you have two on three right here somebody's gonna come free the numbers are not even so therefore Claiborne gets through Goff can't step up in the pocket therefore it throws an ever player the next time you have the linebackers you have Kyle Benoit and Dante Hightower Dante Hightower they come through and they actually run the same exact game Hightower comes through he picks the center and the guard therefore allowing Dan Oy to come around. Mm -hmm. It's funny, he picks him, but then he pulls himself through. Mm -hmm. Once again, can't step up in the pocket, cannot make the throw. This play here, yes, we're going to count up the numbers. Our guys up, upstairs with the film did a great job with the graphics, but I'm going to highlight something that's really important. It's Dante Hightower. He's going to be up top uh, over there um, on the right tackle. He's going to come down, and on this play, he's going to show sure will power and just bull rush the right tackle here. You see him highlight it and just doesn't make any particular move, just bull rushes, pushes them back into the quarterback's lap. And therefore, once again, Goff cannot step up and make this throw. Now here in the red zone, scoring situation, what do you do? You call all out zero pressure. And it's interesting, the DBs are off and they have vision inside because in this place, when you have all out pressure, the ball has to come out quick. They bring the two safeties into the B gap. Gurley has to pick one, right? Therefore, number 21 gets open, Harmon, Goff can't step up. And what Kyle Van Noy said, he threw up a buttercup. <laughs> yeah. cool. And, that's and that's right. the issue. They kept putting pressure in his face where he could not step up. And that's where they had issues all game. Took away the play action. And that's where it all stemmed yeah. from. Yeah. And he, could, he, he, could, he couldn't do anything. And, and Brady just disrupted him. And they took everything away. You couldn't run the ball. Can't get it to Woods. Cooks did have a good game. However, can Goff beat us? And they didn't think he could.
I mean, it wasn't a game that had a ton of highlights from an average fan standpoint. I'm sure a lot of people thought that this defense. But it was a beautiful defense, game, Lindsay. It was really a, look at but it. it really was, <laughs> it really though, was. for somebody right. that really. It was such like, a chess match. Mm -hmm. It was a chess yeah. match, and it's interesting the day after to go and look at the different pieces. Uh, people who did not have to be convinced about the beauty of this game are the Patriots fans, particularly the ones who are diehard enough to go out to the facility today to welcome the. Uh, they arrived there earlier today. Mike Giardi was among those who were there. Hi, Mike. Yeah, Lindsay, about a thousand people here at Gillette Stadium waiting for the team buses to arrive. Of course, the team flew back uh, late uh, morning, early afternoon, got to TF Green Airport in Providence around 2.15, bussed over to Gillette Stadium, got here around 3.20 at Gillette. You can hear the crowd very excited to get a glimpse of uh, their Super Bowl heroes. Jason McCourty given the Super Bowl trophy by Bill Belichick and running out there greeting the fans. Of course, he was 0-16 last year, and now in his 10th season, he is finally a Super Bowl champion. One guy who was not on that bus, defensive coordinator, Brian Flores. Well, he's not the defensive coordinator anymore. He's the coach of the Miami Dolphins, but what a plan he and Bill Belichick put together. And just to add to your conversation, basically on every play, two defensive play calls sent into the huddle. And what they would do is they would wait for Sean McVay to get out of Jared Goff's ear. And if that first play call they didn't like, they'd switch to the second one. Uh, many times, two or three seconds before the ball was snapped, Goff didn't know what he was seeing. And I think that's why you saw him holding, pumping, and not being decisive with throws. Lindsay, a terrific plan and a great way for Brian Flores to go out here in New England. Yeah, that's one of the things that we talked about in the week leading up to this that we'd seen on tape, that that might be something that they might come out and try to do to confuse Jared Goff. Uh, it looks like they did that very successfully. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, you mentioned that Brian Flores is not with the team. You know who else is not in Foxborough? <laughs> uh -oh. Tom Brady and MVP Julian Edelman. That's because they went to Disney World today and uh, had some fun at the new Star Wars exhibit. Sith Lords. Uh, I mean, look at them. What a bromance these two that have. That is a total bromance. Like Nighthawk and Dragon. <laughs> right? Step brother style. They're on the this. Toy Story ride. <laughs> same glasses? Yeah, same glasses. Come on. Yeah, that's cute. Uh, there were a lot of fans that were there, too. I mean, that parade was packed with Patriots fans, which is sort of like the entire week looked in Atlanta. Mm. And use those Jedi mind tricks, walk up to vendors. You will not charge me $75 for a second. <laughs> now, let's stick with those Super Bowl champs, Patriots, former D.C., as we heard, Mike Giardi is Brian Flores, now the front man for the Dolphins. The announcement, of course, becoming official as Flores was introed earlier today as the 13th head coach of the Miami franchise. Now, Flores, before today, a New England lifer who began his career as a scouting assistant with the Pats back in 04, and here he is on his new gig. We're going to do everything possible to... to, to to win games and build build you know the culture and build uh, build a winner here um, and and I'll do everything in my power um, and 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 work as hard as possible to make that happen. Brian Flores, another 30-something with a head coaching gig, and we now bring in Rap Sheet here with more in when it comes to ripple effect. What's it going to be like with Flores making the move to the Dolphins as their new head coach? Well, it's interesting. The Miami Dolphins already have their staff basically done. Chad O'Shea going to be the offensive coordinator. Patrick Graham, the defensive coordinator. But his old staff does have a huge hole in it now with their defensive play caller now really standing right there, posing with his family. So who is going to come in and run this defense? My understanding is Greg Schiano right now is the person uh, who is the most likely candidate to come in and be the defensive play caller, potentially the defensive coordinator, though New England is always a little odd with titles, so he may not actually get that title. The expectation is that Schiano and Belichick, close friends, are going to talk early this week to finalize things and figure out which direction they're going. All right, Ian, since we're talking about moves and ripple effects, how about Zach Taylor, former Rams quarterback, coach named the head coach of the Bengals so what more can you tell us there well, as far as his staff goes we know a couple things Brian Callahan a, a bright young star in this coaching world former quarterbacks coach of the Raiders he's going to be his offensive coordinator it sounds like Darren Simmons according to Tom Pelissero staying on as the special teams coach they need a defensive coordinator and what teams like to do pair a young head coach with a veteran Jack Del Rio expected to come in and speak with with Zach Taylor that is going to be later in the week. Of course, the former Oakland Raiders head coach wants to get back in the league and has a very strong resume as a D.C. Mm, all those head coaching vacancies finally filled. Rap sheet, as always, good stuff. Thank you, sir.
There are still scratching my head about Todd Gurley. Ten <laughs> carries for 35 yards, one catch for negative one. Uh, he went 21 minutes of game time between his first touch and his second touch in this game. What is happening here? I don't know. Everything everything is fishy here. Even down to when he was in practice here in Thousand Oaks, he had the big giant knee brace that you get from Rite Aid, <laughs> you know, and then he comes down the plane and he has the Normatec boots with him, which is you use that to get rid of yeah. inflammation. And then he gets an MRI. You don't get an MRI unless something's really wrong. And, Absolutely. you know, I played 12 years. Or at so. least if you're checking to see if something's exactly, wrong. So you yeah. think, like, what is this? Right. And then you hear CJ. It's, this is funny what we do in media. So we find so, we find him real vulnerable. He's, he just lost. So he's very emotional. And he says, he said, you know, girl, he said he's going to go as much as he could. So that right there. Todd was going to go as much as he can. Yes, Todd was going to go you as don't much. Say that unless he's limited. Unless so. he's limited, right. Yeah. So he almost kind of told himself right there. Yeah, but really. they keep telling us that he's healthy. Of course they will, yeah. But why? After after the game, would they continue to insist that he was healthy, especially when the game turned out the way that it did? It would be an easy thing to point to and say, well, that's why we didn't use him as much, oh, yeah. or that's why he wasn't yeah. the same Todd Gurley. It's a good point, and maybe it'll come out. Maybe in the next couple weeks someone will say something that he was injured. But I, I don't know if right after the game, I think they wanted to give credit to the New England Patriots, not right. just say right out with the excuses, oh, Gurley right. was hurt, that's why we lost. Exactly. So that's probably a little bit to do with it. Um, but, yeah, it's a tough situation. Was was. The running back rotation part of the reason that they couldn't find a rhythm offensively, do you I think? No, I don't think that it was that as much as it was the Patriots' defense. I think that they've done a good job throughout the playoffs not really giving up any rushing yards throughout the entire three-game stretch. So, you know, for me, I think I think Sean Neve tried. I think he did try. I think that's sometimes we get caught in that, oh, well, they didn't run the ball enough with Todd Gurley. So be careful because when they did run the football with him, they were only getting about two, three yards. So as a play caller with guy, uh, the guy that can have some elaborate schemes and maybe feel like he can create some plays – you almost lean towards that if you're not getting enough on the ground. Well, we know who will be number one as for the rest of the list that comes out tomorrow. Elliot, yeah. that'd do it for me. A little, a little victory right there, as good as it gets. And uh, Tom Brady, six Super Bowl championships, eye-popping. But when it came to his game on Sunday, the offensive numbers, not really eye-popper like he had last season. But when I take a look at what Tom Brady was able to do, drive the team down the field, whether it was to get that game-winning drive or to run out the yeah. clock to secure that win, when it comes to the Rams staying up at night, which one of those two drives is going to keep them up the latest? Well, yeah, that's the one thing you have to look at. If you're the Rams, schematically you can deal with some of those things because yeah. you can say we can fix that, right? But physically on that last drive when they took eight straight runs and went 70-plus yards, took three minutes off the clock, and basically ran out of the stadium with the Lombardi Trophy. <laughs> that was a crusher, man, because you had guys missing their fits in the run game, maybe trying too hard, maybe trying to make too many plays. Keep Tlaib's a great football player, but he didn't want anything to do with that run right there on the last play. So that, that was the difficult part for me if you're a Rams player probably for the most part because you're saying I, I physically probably could have done a little bit more to get there. Because really they didn't get they, – they got the ball back with 10. They were down 10 with one minute left. Mm -hmm. No timeouts. It's pretty much over at that point. Yeah, for me, man, it was – I think it was the first one. As a defender, when they scored that touchdown, it's like, man, we're doing everything right all game. Yeah. And therefore, we give up those two big plays to Gronk and then the touchdown to Sonny Michelle. As a defender, that would have – I think that's what messed them up and then – Uh, I think there are a lot of sleepless nights ahead for players on the Rams team, including their coaching staff. You heard Sean McVay say that he got out coached. Yeah. Uh, wh in what specific areas do you think he's going to think about this game and be haunted to some degree? Probably opening up more. You know, we know that they did well all year, all season running the football, and then that predicated for them to do well in the play action. New England took all that away. They took every single thing away. For, for him, maybe I was I mentioned last night, I was like, why won't they just like go empty and maybe let golf just dial it up quick game? You know, try to get the ball to your receivers quick out in the open. Even put Todd Gurley out there as a receiver. Maybe they couldn't. Once again, everyone's speculating what happens, what's wrong with his knee. So I think just more so making an, another adjustment. Right, you wanna you wanna stick with what got you there, the condensed formations, the crossing routes, the play action. But you should also have a backup plan. You should also be able to adjust within the game. And I think that's one thing Sean's probably going to kick himself with. Well, interestingly enough, that's what the Patriots did. Exactly. They did exactly what you said, and they were able to kind of go outside the box and kind of pull on their experience of being in that situation and say, let's just do something we haven't practiced Especially before. when Chung went down. They yeah, had exactly. To they had to switch the sure. whole backfield. Yeah, exactly. It was really good. It felt like there were a few third downs late in the game in particular where it felt like you've got nothing to lose. Just take a shot. Like, yeah. find a way to get a bunch of guys downfield and just go for it. Yeah, it was, it was difficult. 
difficult because when Sean McVay, who is your rock, who is your guy that you've right. leaned on for schematic excellence all year, kind of gets you in situations like this. It was third and one, third and two. They expect man coverage. It wasn't man coverage. It was cover two. Like, everyone in the league plays press man to man coverage on this down. You get the crossing routes. We're going to get some picks. We're going to get guys going. But they're just jamming people up and playing zone coverage. Goff had nowhere to throw the football. And that's where you hear Sean McVay make the comments like, I, I didn't put my guys in the right situation. But at the same time, you gotta, you gotta rise above that. You know, the cover zero blitz where he throws the interception. You know, some guys can just check out of that play. Right. You not see zero throw that ball. Yeah, you saw zero. Goff is back there. McVeigh's on the sideline. At some point, Goff has to take the reins and say, we have, I have to win this football game. And, and they didn't do it. Great game plan uh, yeah, by really Bill was. Belichick and Brian Flores. However, they distribute that kind of responsibility. And what a way to go out for Brian Flores. That's his last game <laughs> right. with the Patriots yeah. after a number of years with them. He now moves on to Miami. Now second all-time in postseason receiving yards and third on this list of just Super Bowl yards. Jerry Rice tops both lists. Lynn Swan's ahead of him on this list here. Ten catches, eight of them went for first down, David Carr. Uh, he kept the the chains moving. He kept yeah. the clock going, and they dominated in time of possession. It strikes me that he impacted this game in so many ways. He really did in the run game as well. I mean, early on in the game, they were running the football effectively, and Julian was going there digging guys out and hit him in the mouth, and it was, it was impressive to watch, and that kind of set up everything else down the field. And what he did down the field was as impressive as anything that I've seen in the Super Bowl. I mean, a lot of these routes that he runs are interesting because the stem isn't straight the field. That means he doesn't just run straight. He looks like he's about to cross the field. So to leave in this situation thinks maybe I have to run across the field with him, breaks it back out. That's an unconventional route. You wouldn't really see that, but he runs it effectively. Now we'll try and put Marcus Peters on it. Peters is afraid he's going to get beat to the flat. Julian sticks his foot in the ground, comes back up the field. Obviously, Brady has a great relationship with him. They make huge gain off of really what Peters is just out of position. And then Nikel Roby Coleman tries his hand at it. Okay, here's another stint. Same thing. It looks like he's about to cross the field. Even the safety starts working that way. And then now he has 10 yards of separation on Nikel Roby Coleman. And they tried everything. I mean, they threw everything they could at Edelman. Zone coverage, man coverage, every, every, every other look. We didn't even show half the plays where he went out and just found a, an appropriate place to kind of settle. And Brady was able to find him. So it was impressive. I mean, he, clearly the MVP, very deserving. Yeah, there are going to be people who say, how clear is it? Because he didn't score a touchdown. And how important were those catches that he made? Yeah. But those first downs and the well, controlling the clock exactly. and the fact that the Patriots were on the field for 44 plays in the first half, you have to wonder what that did to the Rams defense well, and, in the second oh, half. Oh, absolutely, as far as being on the field. And then he was the reason that they were able to stay on the field. I mean, every one of those catches in the first half was for a first down on third down. So he was able to make some huge plays for them. And then even on the plays like late in the game where Gronkowski with the catch on the seam, he was being double teamed at the line of scrimmage. So literally jammed like a punt returner. So that opened up Gronk for a big play. Yeah, he was impressive. So you saw the commercials. It would be self-serving to I say did. that the NFL